Good evening. Good to have you with us tonight for our midweek Bible study in the book of Daniel. This last Wednesday of, in the last day of the month of August. I uh, hope that uh, you are ready for uh, fall and we pray for some cooler temps. Uh, but uh, good to have you with us, t with us tonight. Go ahead and grab your Bible and join me in Daniel chapter 4. We're going to unpack an amazing chapter and there's so much in this chapter that there's no way I could cover everything that's in this chapter tonight. So I'm going to uh, whet your appetite to come back Sunday morning and join us in worship at 10 o'clock and I will continue uh, as we look at uh, what this chapter has for us because it has uh, a message. It's not just a historical narrative that's good to read. Uh, but it's also got uh, something for us that we deal with, uh, all of us deal with on a regular basis and how to cope with it. We're going to see in the life of King Nebuchadnezzar on Sunday uh, what took place in his life that changed his life that can also change your life. But tonight we're going to kind of introduce you to it and uh, we're going to talk about one particular I think theme that you see in this chapter that has to do with the Most High God and the fact that He rules over the human kingdoms of this earth. That means uh, the government of the United States of America and the government of every other nation on this planet. Uh, we're going to learn from uh, uh, something that God was wanting King Nebuchadnezzar uh, to come to realize in regards to his rule and his reign. So uh, let's look at it together. Again, we're going to continue Sunday morning, so I hope that you will be back with us so that you can get the full uh, scope of this really amazing, awesome chapter. Uh, there is a purpose behind every time we open the Word of God, and so let me again remind you to be asking yourself the question, why in the world would God put these kind of chapters in the Bible? Uh, what is it all about? What does it mean for me? How do I apply it? And I hope to help you with that uh, tonight and on Sunday. But let's look at it beginning with verse 1 of chapter 4. Uh, it says, King Nebuchadnezzar to all people's nations and languages that dwell in all the earth. Peace be multiplied to you. And I got to stop right off the bat there if you will notice uh, that this is in the first person. Uh, I want you to notice first off, that's interesting to me, uh, first person singular, which tells me, and there's, there's, there's debate about whether uh, Nebuchadnezzar himself wrote this, um, whether he was the person who penned it or not, uh, this is his words, no question. This is his words, and in a sense, this is his testimony. Um, and so let me remind you, uh, we are talking about King Nebuchadnezzar. And just uh, to kind of uh, help you have the context of this chapter, you know a little bit about him from previous studies. He is uh, the greatest, uh, at this point in time, he was the greatest king on the planet. Um, he was um, of the Babylonian Empire. He had faced uh, lots of attacks as we looked at him in the first uh, three chapters, and he overcame those. Uh, and at this point in chapter 4, he is a person who is, uh, uh, his kingdom is at ease. And so he is at ease, as we're going to see in verse 4. He's contented. He's at peace. Um, again, he's, uh, he's weathered the attacks and the storms. And he has become an uh, incredibly uh, powerful uh, leader, king. Uh, he sh actually has struck fear in his enemies at this point. By the time we come here, you could call this his retirement. He's right at the verge of retirement. Also, you need to know, though, on besides those uh, things about him, he was also known as the most brutal, nasty, evil king up to this point that been on the earth. And that's really an under understatement. You go back some sometime and read through Jeremiah 39, and you'll really see how nasty and evil uh, he was. And 2 Kings 25, I invite you to go back and read those sometime. Uh, the account of the Babylonian besieging of Jerusalem, 
I'm going to give you just one thing out of that that just uh, tells you a little bit of how brutal and nasty and evil he really was. Uh, he had uh, Hezekiah bring his sons in, and in front of Dad, he plucked the eyes out of his out of the sons of Hezekiah uh, and killed them right there in front of his dad. And can you just imagine that? Uh, and on top of that, he burned down, of course, the city of Jerusalem on his way in. He carried people into slavery. He looted the temple, and he, uh, he, he stole things uh, from the temple. Uh, there's one word to describe him, bad. I mean, bad. And what we're going to see, though, in this chapter 4, and really we see it in chapter 2 and chapter 3 also, he would not bow his knee to Yahweh God, but what's interesting is he wouldn't bow a knee to the Babylonian gods either. And um, there's no record. I find no record of uh, him bowing his knee to Marduk, uh, the, the god, uh, lower G, uh, of, the, of the Babylonians. Some say he was, he was non-religious, and I, I take upset, objection to that. I, I think he was very religious. And the reason I think he was very religious is you see in this chapter and you see even in the previous chapter that he did worship a god and that god was himself. Yes, that's right. King Nebuchadnezzar worshipped himself. He was full of me, myself, and I, I like to call it. And uh, what we're going to see here as well is that uh, scholars have often argued about uh, it, and, it, and it can be pl it's plausible and it certainly is probable but I don't believe it is the case uh, that's made here by some that Nebuchadnezzar we read in the first three, cha three chapters is not the same King Nebuchadnezzar that we read here in this chapter uh, and I'm not going to get into the arguments you can do some research on that uh, on your own but I would just simply say I, I don't believe that I believe that it's the same King Nebuchadnezzar that we've been reading about in chapters 1, 2, and 3. So moving along, you would think this is so crazy that God is going to use this kind of a bad guy, uh, where he's going to even, he quotes scripture in that first verse I just read, he said, peace be multiplied to you. So he's using scripture there, he's a bad dude, but he's using scripture, and look what he writes down, look, look what the next two verses say. It has seemed good to me to show the signs and wonders, here it is, that the Most High God has done for me. Now, here he is, and then he has a song. Look at the next verse. How great are his signs. This is a song. How mighty his wonders. His kingdom is everlasting kingdom, and his dominion endures from generation to generation. So here you have this brutal, nasty monarch dictator, and he's moved from being that to being a worship leader. I want you to pick up on that right away, if you would. It's interesting. Uh, and what you see here, and I've, it happened in previous chapters, is what is called a liter literary device that's used often in the writings in the Old Testament of reverse chronolo chrono 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 chronology. Well, that's a tough word to say. Um, it's kind of like movies. They start with the end at the beginning of the movie, and then they give you the rest of the story uh, that will tie in to that ending. Uh, that's what you see here. Uh, he, was not, he was not a good guy, but what, look what comes out of his mouth. And the people had to be absolutely stunned when they hear this. And so it makes you want to ask the question, what's happened in King Nebuchadnezzar's life? This cruel, mean, nasty, monarch, dictator, something's happened in his life. There's, there's got to be something that's taken place that's brought about a change. And we're going we're gonna to really spend more time on that uh, Sunday morning, so don't miss that. Because it's a change that God wants to bring about in your life and my life with something that we face, that we deal with on a daily basis that's a part of our human nature, part of our flesh. But let's look at what happened. Let's look at what took place. Verse five, 4, let me continue. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at ease in my house, near retirement, 
prospering in my palace. I saw a dream that made me afraid. So here we go again. He's already had a couple dreams, and now he's getting he's getting messed up with another dream. He says, as I lay in the bed, the fancies and the visions of my head alarmed me, uh, literally scared him. So I made a decree that all the wise men of Babylon should be brought before me. Here we go again, all those spiritualists that we've seen in chapter 2 and chapter 3, that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. So then the magicians, the enchanters, the Chaldeans, and the astrologers came in. You've heard about them before, if you've been with us on Wednesday night. And I told them the dream. But they could not make known to me its interpretation. So here we go again. They were, they were of no good. Um, they couldn't help him out again. Uh, I guess the word would be they were, they were impotent again to be able to help him with the interpretation of the dream. But then, uh, at last, Daniel came in before him, who was named Belteshazzar. Notice he refers to him here in his Babylonian name that he had been given. After the name of my God, and in whom is the spirit of the holy God. If you write in your Bibles, let me encourage you to either underline that or circle that. It's a key phrase that I want to help you with in just a moment. Uh, you know, here we have this king. He's got everything that he could ever want or hope for, hope to have. And uh, he's in his twilight days, years. He's probably preparing how he's going to go give the kingdom over to his successor and take care of it. And then he has a, this, this dream that alarms him, again, frightens him. But he realizes, I really believe like before, he realizes this, this dream is different in that it's a prediction of things that are to become for me, he thinks. So once again, he requests all these spiritualists, and guess what? They can't deliver uh, as they were in chapter 2. So now he calls Daniel, and Daniel, notice, has moved up the ladder. Daniel is uh, now the chief magician. He's, he's moved ahead of all these other guys because they couldn't cut the, cut the cake uh, with, the, with the king. I think maybe a good case could be made at this point that possibly 30, possibly 40 year gap took place between chapter 3 and chapter 4. And so Daniel's, Daniel's done well. He's worked his way up the ladder. He's gained the respect of the king. Um, he tells him his dream as we read here. Um, he told him the dream beginning in verse 9, O Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy God is in you, and that no mystery is too difficult for you, tell me the vision of my dream that I saw and their interpretation. The vision of my head as I lay in bed were these. I saw and behold a tree in the midst of the earth, and its height was great. Perhaps it was just started as a plant, but now it's a tall tree and it's getting taller. The tree grew and became strong, and its top reached to the heaven and it was visible to the end of the whole earth. Its leaves were beautiful, and its fruit abundant, and in it, was, in it was food for all. The beast of the field found shade under it, and the birds of the heavens lived in its branches, and all flesh was fed from it. And I saw in the visions of my head as I lay in the bed, behold, a watcher, a holy one, came down from heaven. Let me stop there for a moment and let's focus again on this. Uh, I love that phrase that he's got that, that he's recorded there that it's because it's interesting he's, he's grabbed Daniel because the spirit of the Holy God is in him. Did you catch that? In other words, King Nebuchadnezzar has picked up on there's something different about Daniel. And it's not something that does has to do with the outside of him, but it has to do with something on the inside of him. There's a holy difference, a set-apart holy God in his life that King Nebuchadnezzar sees, and, and, and it catches his attention. And so he describes what he saw, and then in verse 13, notice it says that in that vision he saw a watcher. A holy one. I love that term watcher, and if you do a good Hebrew study, 
which I would encourage you to do, you will come to discover that that's a term only one other time is it used to describe angels uh, watching over the activities of human beings. You have angels. If you are a child of God, a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, you have angels watching over you. I have angels watching over me. And, and so here they're looking at Nebuchadnezzar's life. Obviously, they've been looking at his life, these angels, and observing the fact that he did not measure up to the standard of holiness that's been set by the holy God. And so this watcher, this holy one, has been sent to offer a word of warning to King Nebuchadnezzar. So let's pick it back up. Here's the word of warnings beginning with verse 14. He proclaimed aloud, that is the watcher, the holy one, and said thus, speaking to King Nebuchadnezzar, he proclaimed aloud and said thus, chop down the tree and lop off its branches, strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the beast flee from under it and the birds from its branches, but leave the stump from its roots in the earth bound with a band of iron and bronze amid the tender grass of the field. Let him be wet with the dew of heaven. Let his portion be with his, the beast in the grass of the earth. Let his mind be changed from a man's and let the beast's mind be given to him. And let seven periods of time pass over him. And then we come to really the purpose verse that really gives the purpose for not only this chapter, but I believe it's at the heart of the purpose of the book. The sentence is by the decree of the watchers from God through the angels, through the watchers, the holy ones. The dead is decision by the word of the holy ones to the end of that the living may know that the most high rules the kingdom of men that is the human kingdoms on earth and gives it to whom he will and sets over it the lowliest of men. Let me stop there and I want us to think about for a moment what's going on here and again the purpose really verse 17 gives us the purpose for this whole dream. Some people think if you if you look at verse 19 then, Nebuchad then Daniel uh, whose name was Belt to Shazar was dismayed for a while and his thoughts alarmed him. Uh, what I want you to understand there, a lot of folks misunderstand that to think that he was shaking in his boots or sandals, I guess we should say, that Daniel was, but that's not the case. Uh, we, don't, we can't get that from Daniel. Daniel, very strong uh, young man, as we've seen in the previous chapters, and so uh, you know, he's not thinking, I don't want to tell this king, uh, this dream, because I'm, I'm afraid of what he's going to do to me. He's going to get mad, and he's, and maybe he's going to kill me. I'll die. I think that's a wrong way to look at this. We don't have any evidence, again, that Daniel's that kind of person. And But I want to stop at this point and say, I don't know about you, but I hate to deliver bad news to someone, no matter who that may be. And uh, here he is, verse 19, and I don't think he was fearing for his life, but Again, he's, he's, that's part of what God's plan is uh, for him to share the, the interpretation of this dream, and it does have to do with King Nebuchadnezzar. But I think it's showing that he had compassion on this king. I think one of the things he loved about Daniel, this king, was he wasn't just a yes man, but I think he loved the fact that Daniel would give him the truth. Uh, he was a truth man. And that's what I think our world leaders need today. And here's where I want you to really focus with me for a moment. Because if you go back and look at the verse, again, the key verse, it says in verse 17, that the Most High, that is God, rules the kingdom of men. That is, rules the kingdom of the United States, the kingdom of Great Britain, the kingdom of Iraq, Iran, China, Russia, you name it, is what that's saying. That the Most High rules the kingdom of men, human kingdoms, and it gives it to whom he will and sets over it the lowliest of men. And so, can I get a witness on this? 
I think that's what our world leaders need to hear today. And I've been praying, and I want to encourage you to pray that uh, our leaders, uh, pray for them. My prayer is being, God, send a godly man to President Biden. Send a godly woman to Vice President Harris. Send a godly woman to uh, uh, those uh, woman senators that are of the progressive party group. And uh, to all in, uh, in leadership, God, send godly men and women into the lives of the leaders of our nation, of our state, our country, and even locally. We need to be praying that. God send godly men and women that would speak the truth into their lives. That's what's needed. To, can I get a witness? I pray that. I pray God would send a godly man into President Biden's life, a man of faith who would tell him the truth that he needs to hear. You may not want to hear it, uh, just like King Nebuchadnezzar at, at this point probably didn't want to hear this interpretation of this dream, but I'm so thankful Daniel shows us what we need uh, with our government leaders. We need to speak the truth to them. And I want to come back to that in just a moment because, you know, to get the good news, you got to have bad news. And, and you got and that's true with, some, with most people. The, the good news isn't so good if you don't understand how bad the bad news is. Can I get an amen? And your predicament is before Jesus Christ. I pray that more and more men of faith and women of faith will say, you know what? Come on, I know this may not be what the world wants to hear, but this is what the world needs to hear. And I'm not talking about a watered-down truth. I'm not talking about a mixture of uh, false uh, thoughts and ideas on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and other of our news outlets that is not the truth, but that we would go to the Word of God for the truth and we would seek God's wisdom to speak that truth, what is truth, into the lives of leaders in our country. And we're going to just close with prayer for President Biden and for other leaders so uh, please, I hope that you will join me for that time of prayer to end. But let's let's finish this up. Now we get to uh, the interpretation of the dream. Um, look at verse 20. Look what it says. <laughs> verse 20 says this. The tree you saw. So here's the interpretation of the dream. The tree you saw which grew and became strong so that its top reached to heaven and it was visible to the end of the whole earth, whose leaves were beautiful, uh, and its fruit abundant, and in which was food for all, under which beasts of the field found shade, and in whose branches the birds of the heavens lived. It is you, O king, who have grown and become strong. Your greatness has grown and reaches to the heavens, and your dominion to the ends of the earth. And because... The king saw a watcher, a holy one, coming down from heaven and saying, Chop down the tree and destroy it, but leave the stump of its roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze in the tender grass of the field, and let him be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beast of the field, till seven periods, most scholars believe that's worth saying seven years, of time pass over him. This is the interpretation, O King. It is a decree of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord the King, that you shall be driven from among men, and your dwelling shall be with the beast of the field. You shall be made to eat grass like an ox. In other words, he's going to be a grass-fed king uh, for seven years. And you shall be wet with the dew of heaven, and seven periods of time shall pass over you, till you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men, that is human kingdoms on earth, and gives it to whom he will. And as it was commanded to leave the stump of the roots of the tree, 
your kingdom shall be confirmed for you from the time that you know that heaven rules. Therefore, O king, says, let me give you some advice, if I may. Would you listen to me, king? Break off your sins by practicing righteousness and your iniquities by showing mercy to the oppressed, that there may perhaps be a lengthening of your prosperity. That's the interpretation of the dream. And he's basically has said to the king, you've, you've accomplished incredible success. Babylon is the most powerful and largest empire and city on the planet. No one is more successful than you. But, big but, God is sharpening his axe. And the tree is about to be cut down. But what's interesting is it's not going to be completely destroyed. Did you catch that? The tree may still grow again. If you go back to verse 15, there is that indication. Your empire, your kingdom is going to be chopped down, but its stump, its roots are going to be left standing in the midst of a grassy field. And the stuff, the, the, the band is going to be a band of iron and bronze, which means there will be a strong band. I get the idea there that some kind of strong fence uh, placed around the stump in order to protect it from being totally destroyed. Here's the point. The metal band is symbolic of the preservation of Nebuchadnezzar's life and his kingdom. And you see in verse 26, look at it. So while he's going to be chopped down, not going to totally destroy him. It's going to be a protection that keeps him from being totally annihilated. But the outcome of it, he's going to live outdoors as a grass-fed king with the animals, not like lions and che cheetahs, but more like with cattle and sheep for seven years. We'll look more at that Sunday morning. And we'll stop at this point. The story, what is in it for you and for me? The point of this up to this point in verse 25 is it, it's a warning. Uh, it's a warning to him. It's a warning to us. It's a point uh, to teach us a valuable lesson that the Most High God, let me repeat verse 17, that the Most High God is the ruler over all human kingdoms. Oh, my goodness. That God is the ruler over all. President Biden, Vice President Harris, and all those other men and women that are our leaders in Congress and our state leaders and our local leaders, what that saying is, God is, is the ruler over all of them. And he doesn't stop there. It says, just like your, yours, King Nebuchadnezzar, and not only is he the ruler of it, King, God, Jehovah God, but as the ruler of it, he gives them to anybody that he wants to give them to. And so we don't need to be fearful. We don't need to be fearful about what's going to happen next with the election midterm and then the election coming up. Uh, we don't need to be worried. We need to be just on our knees praying that God would again, God bring godly men and women into the lives of our leaders to speak the truth into their lives. This truth right here, that they are there where they are. They, he's president because of God. <laughs> vice President Harris is vice president because of God. God rules, as the scripture says, over all the kingdoms. And he puts who he chooses where he wants them to be. And so he is the one behind it all. And so we must go to him and recognize that. Uh, what a beautiful, beautiful reminder in this chapter that I wanted to just close with tonight. And what he's saying is, I, I know this is kind of bad news for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. It's, it's not really about your enemies. It's about you, King Nebuchadnezzar. And that band of iron around the stump. In fact, I want you to go back. Because you, you may have missed this, and I missed it too, because I was going to highlight it when I was reading it. Go back to verse, uh, uh, let's see, verse 14. He said, verse 15, but, the leaf, but leave the stump of its roots in the earth bound with a band of iron and bronze amid the tender grass of the field. Notice the change of pronoun. Let him be wet with the dews of heaven. 
So what you see here is that in the midst of this uh, this uh, dream, it changes from being a a tree, inanimate tree. It changes to being a person, and another indication that it's about King Nebuchadnezzar. Um, and so what is he saying here to King Nebuchadnezzar in this dream? He's saying that the band of iron around the stump means that when you come to your spiritual senses, king, maybe you'll get a kingdom back. That's what he's saying to him. Because in verse 27 we see, as I just read, God is gracious. Even in the Old Testament we see here God is a gracious, he's a loving God, he's quick. right place in our lives let me repeat that again because I think I just went offline he's saying to King Nebuchadnezzar in verse 27 let me give you some advice stop sinning do what is right stop your wickedness show mercy to the oppressed and if you do that, maybe God will give an extension of your prosperity, of what he's been experiencing. Of uh, Again, he's been contented, he's been relaxed because he's accomplished everything you could ever imagine accomplishing as a king. Uh, he was prosperous, and uh, he was in reti near retirement age. And so he's saying, uh, that can continue for you, king, or come back to you, king, but not until you uh, again turn from your wickedness and do the right thing great reminder here isn't it as we close tonight what a wonderful nugget we have here that we have to share the whole truth of the gospel you know sometimes to get to the good news you've got to share the bad news in people's lives let me say that again sometimes to get to the good news with someone you've got to share the bad news in that person's life let me close with this quote from David Helm. He says it so well, better than I could. He says, quote, We must be willing to share the bad news with people, that they are out of sorts with God. Yes, brothers and sisters in the Lord, in our church. They are out of sorts with God, even as our hearts break for them. While we're saying it, David says here, we must be willing to tell others that God is not pleased with their pride. And that's what we're going to unpack Sunday that we all struggle with. We must be willing to say why God works against us so that we might one day know that he rules and that we don't rule our lives, but that he rules our lives, that he is the one sovereign and in control. So finally, what we see here, we must be ready to call for repentance and offer hope for people, for brothers and sisters that have strayed from the truth, that have uh, fallen into sin, addiction to uh, uh, habitual sin. We need to stand on the truth and speak the bad news so that we can speak the good news. Uh, of a loving God, of a merciful God, and we do it in a kind, even the bad news, we speak it in a kind and loving, uh, gracious way, but we need to do that. That's what we see here. That's the takeaway for you and for me, that, uh, oh, the church in our country will be so much stronger when brothers and sisters get about doing this with one another. Uh, it's that accountability factor that God says in his word over and over again 
that we are to practice with one another uh, that that and that God wants to chastise God will bring discipline through us sharing the bad news and again you don't know how good the good news is until you know how bad the bad news is and how far you've drifted from Jesus Christ your predicament when it comes to Jesus Christ so take heart folks uh, of this powerful nugget of truth that we see here in the first half of this chapter and again we'll pick it back up there Sunday but I want to close with praying for our leaders so can we do that uh, together let's pray for our president vice president and uh, other of our congressmen uh, women senator uh, male and female senators and our state leaders as well as our local ones let's pray for them right now in accordance to what we read here in this chapter four let's pray together father I pray I pray for our leaders of our country starting with President Biden and Vice President Harris and and then I pray for uh, all those that are part of her, his cabinet. I pray for those uh, of our senators in Congress, uh, uh, our legislatures. Father, I pray for our governor. I pray for lieutenant governor. I pray for our, our legislatures here in, the, in uh, Mississippi. I pray for our local leaders. I pray for our mayors of our cities of Hazelhurst and Crystal Springs and Clinton where I live and Father uh, all the other cities around and, and for the leaders uh, in those cities Father I pray we pray from the bottom of our heart God that you would bring godly men and women into their lives that would speak the truth to them what they need to hear uh, not what they maybe want to hear but they would hear the truth God we know you'll use that uh, to bring uh, their hearts to uh, to a place of repentance and a change in their heart, which we're going to see Sunday, Father, as we continue in this chapter, uh, what has happened in King Nebuchadnezzar's life. Uh, for obviously there has been a change from what we read at the beginning of this chapter where he's, he's a worship leader and he's quoting scripture and he's even given a song, uh, <laughs> leading in a song, Father. So we know that uh, you've done a, a new, fresh work in his heart and his life. And so we believe that that can happen in our leaders of our nation. So we pray, God, again, raise up pastors that will uh, speak the truth uh, from the pulpit. Uh, bad news, perhaps, for those that hear it, that are living uh, a life contrary to your will and your way. But, God, that truth needs to be spoken. The truth of the gospel needs to be pronounced uh, more than ever. Uh, in the pulpits in our country. Uh, and so I pray that for my uh, fellow pastors, that you would move them out in that as you move me out in that, Father, uh, for that's what you've called us to do and to be. And Lord, I, I pray that we know who you are, God, but we know that many leaders of our nation, they're blinded to who you are. And we pray that you would do whatever it takes, God, to get their attention get their attention here in our country and in all the countries and nations of this world for God you are the most high God and you rule over every human kingdom on earth the kingdom of men and each of those leaders you rule over them so I thank you and praise you for that I thank you and praise you God that you've also called us to speak with honesty, with, with kindness, with your love, to speak bad news in the lives of others so that we can also speak the good news and they can know truly how good the good news is when they have experienced a drift from you, uh, a life of uh, living contrary to your word and to your ways and to your will. Uh, Father, move us out uh, to be uh, men and women of truth just like we see in Daniel in this chapter father we thank you for this time you've given us to be together thank you for this time we've been in your word well we pray as we leave this time that we will take your word and we will let it take root in our lives where he would bring a change a change of heart change of attitude a change of perspective a change of uh, perhaps even lifestyle certainly a change of of our passion for you our commitment to you and to the truth oh we love you so much thank you for jesus 
Oh, thank you, Jesus, for what you did for us that we couldn't do for ourselves. We give you all the praise, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Again, we honor you tonight. All glory and praise belong to you. Thank you again for this time, Father, in your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So good to have you with me tonight. Hope you'll be with me again Sunday. Again, we're going to continue with this chapter, and you'll not want to miss what really took place to bring about the change in this nasty uh, dictator, mean, evil uh, king. Uh, and you'll find encouragement from that this coming Sunday. Have a good rest of the week. God bless.